Hey, and welcome to our very last uh, video lecture. Um, we'll be discussing the digestive system, and like our other systems, we start off looking at the function. So the function of the digestive system, uh, as you're probably very familiar with, is to take something like food and break it down into its component nutrients that can then be absorbed into the blood and used by the body. But in addition to um, simply thinking about nutrients, uh, the digestive system is also important in regulating the amount of fluids in our body, um, as well as uh, the um, electrolyte homeostasis also being regulated. Um, in addition, uh, our body needs vitamins um, to uh, power many metabolic reactions. You, you uh, need certain vitamins around to have certain reactions proceed. And uh, ingesting vitamins is um, another key function of the digestive system. In addition to taking things in, the digestive system is also um, one of those last chances uh, for our body to excrete metabolic waste. So for example, we've um, talked about bilirubin, uh, which um, is uh, a byproduct of processing hemoglobin in the liver. Uh, and it's gonna be excreted in the bile, which makes it out um, in the uh, excretory process of the digestive system. So we can also get rid of things as well as taking in the things that our body needs. In the digestive system, you have two basic types of organs that you'll find. And um, the one that you're probably most familiar with is, uh, or, or are the organs of the alimentary canal. And basically these form a continuous tube-like structure that weaves from your mouth to the anus. So in order, the alimentary canal consists of the mouth, which is where the food enters, of course, the pharynx uh, responsible for swallowing um, reflexes, the esophagus transporting food to the stomach, where you get um, some mechanical and enzymatic uh, digestion, as well as the um, small intestine, primarily the site of uh, absorption of nutrients, and the large intestine where some absorption takes place, and finally excretion. In addition to the primary uh, tube, the alimentary canal, um, you also have accessory organs that exist uh, to assist in the functions of digestion. Um, so these are going to include in the area of the mouth, you have uh, the teeth and the tongue, um, you have the salivary glands, which are going to assist in chemical digestion, uh, as well as the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas also assisting in the chemical digestion of food. Um, so these are, uh, the, this is the, the total big picture of the digestive system that you have here, organs of the alimentary canal and the accessory organs. So when you're talking about the function of digestive organs, um, you can break these functions down into six different categories. The first of which being ingestion, so taking food or water um, in through the oral cavity into the digestive tract. The next is secretion. So the digestive system, in addition to uh, absorption, which we'll get to later, is also releasing certain substances that aid in digestion. And these substances can be endocrine, they can be hormones um, that regulate cells and, and how they function in the digestive system, or they can be exocrine secretions, um, which include uh, factors that are secreted like mucus or enzymes that also aid in the digestive process. Um, once you swallow a bolus of food, a bolus is the term for this um, basically lump of food that uh, you swallow, that bolus of food is propelled throughout the alimentary canal. And um, aside from the swallowing reflex, which uses some skeletal muscle, um, the, the primary source of propulsion is going to be smooth muscle contraction. Uh, and these smooth muscle contractions occur in coordinated waves uh, that we again call peristalsis, like you saw with the ureters in the urinary system. Um, next is digestion, and there are two classes of digestion, either mechanical, 
So breaking down um, food is the, is the purpose of digestion. And you can mechanically digest using uh, your teeth to grind food. Um, also, your stomach is, has a churning function uh, that serves to mechanically digest food. And uh, chemical digestion, on the other hand, is using enzymes um, and things like acid to break down food into smaller particles that can then be absorbed. The last two functions, um, absorption being chief amongst them, um, include nutrients entering the blood or the lymphatic system. So um, most of the nutrients that you take in in a meal are going to uh, be digested into small enough particles that they can cross the wall of the alimentary canal directly into the bloodstream. Um, other substances like fats uh, are going to, um, or lipids in general, are going to uh, have to enter through the lymphatic system. So uh, blood capillaries are not quite as leaky or as porous as lymphatic vessels are. So substances that tend to stick together like lipids um, need, uh, you know, they, they might otherwise block blood vessels. Um, so they're going to actually travel in through the lymphatic system as opposed to directly into the bloodstream um, where they can then be um, further processed before they end up making it into the blood. Um, so nutrients get absorbed and they either travel directly into the blood or indirectly through the lymphatic system first. And then finally, defecation. So some materials that we ingest, uh, the cellulose in plants, for example, are not digestible. They cannot be broken down any further and they won't be absorbed. Um, so through the process of digestion, those um, items that can't be digested and absorbed are going to be excreted during the process of defecation. Um, so the production of feces. And this is also a way for us to rid the body of some metabolic waste, like uh, I mentioned earlier with bilirubin um, that you find in bile. So um, that would be the last function, is release of all that waste. The organs of the alimentary canal uh, and digestive system at large are uh, largely surrounded by serous membranes, like many of those vital internal organs that contain a visceral layer uh, that touches the organ itself with um, a parietal layer on the outside and serous fluid on the inside. And this serous membrane is no different. This serous membrane we're talking about is the largest found in the body called the peritoneum. Uh, so the peritoneum surrounds many of the organs uh, in the abdominal cavity. Um, and these organs uh, that are inside would be intraperitoneal, and um, some that are uh, also found outside can be uh, partially within and partially outside the um, peritoneum. So um, the peritoneum is going to be the largest serous membrane in the body and provides some uh, protection for those organs and resistance to friction when you're moving around. And this is um, also uh, going to be particularly important in organizing how these organs sit on, e uh, sit on one another and uh, sit inside the abdominal cavity. So the small intestine kind of winds around a lot and it needs to be organized very precisely. So um, the visceral peritoneum is going to have these folds. Um, you can see some images of these folds in your book. Um, called mesenteries, and these surround uh, the small intestine in particular and just organize it so that it's always got the same basic shape and it's not moving around and, um, you know, kind of with how long it is, it's, you could theorize how much movement without these organizing structures um, could, could drastically change that organization. So um, the peritoneum has uh, you know, the, the similar function of a serous membrane that you're um, used to thinking about providing protection um, and kind of uh, cushioning and lubricating with that serous fluid, but also organizing. 
So uh, it's also important to think about what types of cells you'll find uh, if, if you look at a cross section of the alimentary canal. And uh, for the most part, um, all of these different layers of cells that you'll find will be the same uh, no matter what part of the alimentary canal you're talking about. And, and we'll talk about some key differences um, in places like the stomach. So um, you have this innermost hollow area, the lumen, and that's where your food is going to be traveled through. And immediately adjacent to that is the mucosa. So that's named for the mucus that is secreted by these epithelial cells in certain parts of the canal. Um, so you'll find a, a layer of epithelium, um, a layer of connective tissue, and also uh, two layers of smooth muscle um, within the mucosa. So these are thin layers of smooth muscle as opposed to the really thick layers that you'll find um, later on. So um, outside of that mucosa, you'll find a layer called the submucosa. And uh, in the submucosa is lots of um, connective tissue as well as uh, nerves and different blood and lymphatic vessels. Um, so as you can imagine, there's probably gonna be some absorption going on here and your blood vessels will be in the submucosa. Next we have the muscularis externa. So this is two thick layers of muscle. And you can see they have these different arrangements. The first layer is going to have a circular arrangement. Um, and the second layer has what would be, we would call it a longitudinal arrangement. And so these contract independent of one another and working together um, they promote peristalsis. So um, both layers uh, of this muscularis ex externa are going to have to contract to propel food, um, the bolus, along the path of the alimentary canal. Um, and I mentioned that there are some differences in some parts. Uh, there's actually a third arrangement um, of, of smooth muscle in the stomach. So the stomach has a churning function. It's, uh, it assists in mechanical digestion as well as propulsion of food. So it's moving food in one direction, but it's also swirling it up and helping uh, with the digestive process. So in the stomach, in addition to circular and longitudinal smooth muscle, you also have an oblique layer, which again means kind of at an angle. So the muscularis externa for the stomach can also include oblique in addition to circular and longitudinal smooth muscle. And again, that helps with churning. And then finally on the outside, you have the, uh, um, the visceral peritoneum. So um, the layer of the peritoneum that um, makes contact with the organs of uh, the alimentary canal. Um, so this is called the serosa. If you're talking about an organ within the, uh, that you would find inside the peritoneum, um, or if it's found outside, uh, then there's a different layer called the adventitia. So um, if it's within that serous membrane of the peritoneum, um, in, inside that uh, then you would refer to it as serosa. If it exists outside of the peritoneum, again, it's the adventitia. So these are uh, the four primary layers of um, cells that you'll find uh, along the alimentary canal. So the act of moving substances through the alimentary canal uh, depends on this concept of motility. So motility just means the ability to be moved. And motility in the digestive tract is uh, going to be dependent on the function of both skeletal and smooth muscle, depending on which part of motility you're talking about. And those parts, uh, the, the movement of food or uh, the movement of substances throughout the digestive tract um, consists of swallowing, churning uh, in the stomach, remember, uh, is mechanically digested 
uh, churning activity. Um, peristalsis, or those waves, the rhythmic waves of contraction that cause food to move in one direction. Uh, and finally, defecation also requires um, muscular activity. Um, so this motility is dependent on um, both the nervous system and hormones to regulate how active it is. So um, remember the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system being um, fight or flight versus rest and digest. So when you're in a state of rest, you're more able to um, dedicate resources like blood flow toward um, the organs of the digestive system in order to uh, ease the, to facilitate the process of digestion. So blood flow and increase in motility is going to accompany parasympathetic stimulation. Whereas in a fight or flight response, you want to use that blood flow for um, other purposes other than digestion. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to inhibit motility in the digestive tract. Um, and there's also a paracrine influence on motility. So uh, that's hormonal regulation. Um, but that term paracrine means that uh, the cells of these organs themselves are going to uh, regulate their own motility. So as opposed to, um, let's say, you know, um, the, the pancreas uh, releasing insulin or glucagon into the bloodstream, that's going to affect cells all over the body. Whereas in the small intestine, for example, there are cells that release hormones that act on cells in the small intestine. So that is a paracrine effect. Starting with the oral cavity, the first place food ends up in the alimentary canal. Um, the, the purpose of this cavity is to uh, primarily to uh, take food in, of course, to chew it up and create a bolus of food, which is the chewed kind of solid mass that you're going to eventually swallow. Um, in addition to uh, chewing, which includes both your teeth and your tongue uh, kind of assisting with mechanical digestion. Um, another accessory organ that's um, important in the oral cavity is the salivary glands. So you have three of these, and they consist of a secretory cell called an acinar cell. And of these acinar cells, there are two types. One would be the mucus cell, um, and its purpose is, uh, is you know, at, just as the name implies, it produces mucus that's going to um, keep the... Um, the mucosa of the oral cavity. It's going to keep it moist um, and offer some protection, trapping some pathogens, etc. And you've also got serous cells, which are going to be releasing fluid, um, or secreting fluid, I should say, that contains enzymes. So uh, in addition to um, other solutes like bicarbonate ions. So we'll, we'll talk about that more in just a second. But these serous cells are going to be um, releasing substances that uh, help to also do some chemical digestion. The contents of saliva serve several purposes. Um, first and foremost is, again, that chemical digestion of food. So that's going to start in the mouth where you have saliva. And uh, the enzyme that's responsible for this chemical digestion via the saliva is called salivary amylase. Now there's another amylase that we'll discuss later, but salivary amylase is going to start the, um, the process of digestion of polysaccharides, also known as complex sugars. So um, polysaccharides are going to be broken down into smaller polysaccharides. So just the beginning of carbohydrate digestion begins with the saliva. Um, saliva also contains antibacterial uh, or antimicrobial um, substances, including an enzyme called lysozyme, which is going to basically uh, perforate or poke holes in the bacterial cell wall. Um, and also, uh, your saliva contains antibodies. Um, 
So this particular antibody is called IgA, and it's kind of a broad spectrum antibody that um, can bind to and cause the destruction of microbes. So um, the mouth is a great place for bacteria to enter your body, and um, as such, we have several different mechanisms for um, hindering their ability to infect us. So destruction via lysozyme and IgA antibodies. Um, and finally, another issue uh, in, in the digestive tract is sometimes you get backflow. So as, as we saw um, with blood, for example, backflow can be a bad thing. If substances travel in the opposite direction they're supposed to. And this can happen in the stomach. You get um, some backflow sometimes um, that can cause heartburn. So stomach acid um, being present in the esophagus, for example, or um, reflux. Um, so it makes sense that your saliva contains a buffer that can neutralize that acidic pH change um, that will accompany stomach acid flowing up the esophagus. So um, your saliva contains those bicarbonate ions that your body just loves to use to buffer against changes in pH. Um, and those can be used again to neutralize stomach acid. So saliva has, uh, again, the antibacterial um, function. It's got uh, the, the function that it assists with chemical digestion because it contains enzymes. It also moistens the bolus of food, which is going to allow an increase in the mechanical digestion, it's easier to churn and grind up food that's wet. Um, it's also going to dissolve food that's going to help you to taste it. The smaller food particles are, the easier they bind to receptors on your tongue that allow you to taste them. And in addition to taste, smell as well, smell and taste are going to control the salivation reflex. Um, and this can actually uh, be controlled by um, you know, your conscious thought of food as well. But um, there's a salivation reflex that's controlled, uh, stimulated by smell and taste of food. And so those sensory receptors are going to send a signal to your brainstem. Um, and your brainstem is going to control parasympathetic nerve fibers that release acetylcholine onto salivary glands, which respond by creating saliva. So this is, um, again, a, a rest and digest or parasympathetic function. And uh, this reflex kicks in as a result of smelling and tasting food. Next in our journey uh, is going to be the pharynx and the esophagus. So the pharynx is also called the throat and consists of the oropharynx, um, which is kind of the back of the mouth, and then um, the laryngopharynx, which is um, further on down toward the esophagus. So um, the oropharynx contains tonsils um, that are going to uh, trap pathogens and be part of the lymphatic and immune system. Um, and the pharynx has skeletal muscle component that assists in the propulsion of that bolus of food down toward the esophagus. Um, the esophagus is going to be a long tube with thick epithelium, so thick so that there's no absorption of any nutrients going on here. And this is okay because our food isn't yet broken down into a point where um, efficient absorption could even take place. It's also, uh, the esophagus um, is, is part of the involuntary swallowing reflex. So um, your pharynx, you have more voluntary control over the skeletal muscles that control swallowing, whereas the esophagus is composed of both skeletal and smooth muscle. So there's peristalsis occurring here in the esophagus. And there are two sphincters, um, which are little rings of muscle that are going to control the passage of fluid. So the upper esophageal sphincter is going to um, control food entering the esophagus. And the gastroesophageal sphincter is going to, um, its purpose is to prevent the, the contents of the stomach from getting back into the esophagus once they've traveled to the stomach. 
When you're ready to swallow, um, you end up going through three phases of swallowing. The first being voluntary, wherein um, the skeletal muscle that is your tongue is going to push that bolus of food toward the pharynx or the throat, uh, at which point the involuntary uh, part of the swallowing reflex is going to take place. And that involuntary reflex is broken into two stages. So um, the skeletal muscle reflex controlled by the medulla oblongata is going to um, close off the soft palate, uh, meaning um, the soft palate closes off the nasopharynx. So when you're swallowing, food doesn't shoot out your nose. And of course, when you're coughing or laughing, um, this can be overridden. Um, and you also have the epiglottis sealing off the trachea while you're swallowing so that you're not breathing in food as it's being swallowed. Um, the esophageal portion of this involuntary reflex is controlled by peristalsis. So the smooth muscle in the esophagus pushes the bolus of the food down toward the stomach. Um, and before it reaches the stomach, uh, the upper esophageal sphincter is going to open and allow that bolus of food to pass into the stomach. Now our bolus of food has arrived at the stomach uh, where it will be churned and introduced to um, a variety of different substances that are going to assist in digestion. So um, the churning function of the stomach again is made possible by that third oblique layer of uh, smooth muscle that's going to um, allow it to have a different function than just propel food but also to mix it, churning and mixing. And that's going to produce a substance that we now call chyme. So chyme is kind of a slurry, like a partially liquid um, mixture um, that's going to be easy uh, and Easy, easily broken down into um, components, also because it has um, introduced acid and enzymes that can also help to break it down. So chyme is uh, starting to get to the point where um, nutrients can eventually be absorbed. Um, so our bolus of food has been chewed and broken down a bit and moistened, and now the stomach has turned it into this chyme. Um, in, an important part of the uh, mucosa of the stomach, or um, that innermost layer of cells, um, is the presence of these gastric pits, or gastric glands. And these contain a variety of cells that are going to secrete certain substances. So in these gastric glands, you have diffuse neuroendocrine uh, cells, um, so DNAs cells are going to um, secrete hormones. That's why they're called neuroendocrine, is because these hormones are going to act on the enteric nervous system and control things like motility. Um, you also are going to have parietal cells that secrete the stomach acid, this hydrochloric acid, um, that's going to result in a lot of hydrogen ions being present. So um, the stomach is a very acidic environment because of the effect of these parietal cells. And uh, you also have chief cells secreting a substance called pepsinogen. Now pepsinogen, when it's in contact with stomach acid, will be converted into pepsin, which breaks down protein. So protein chemical digestion is facilitated by this enzyme pepsin that's only activated in the presence of stomach acid. And then finally, you have mucus neck cells. So um, this is still a mucosa, and there's still mucus being secreted. So that is the purpose of these mucus neck cells that usually sit up at the neck of these pits. So um, these four cells in these gla gastric glands are going to um, provide these vital substances that help facilitate the function of the stomach, which is to produce chyme um, that will soon be ready for absorption in the small intestine. Now, um, 
there's also the emptying function of the stomach, where the, the stomach can empty into the duodenum of the small intestine. And so um, that emptying function depends on the relaxing of the pyloric sphincter. So this will control motility of that chyme from the stomach to the small intestine. The small intestine, um, once this chyme has reached uh, this area, the small intestine is um, particularly uh, well suited to being an area for absorption of nutrients. And um, there are three sets of basically folded structures that increase the amount of surface area there is for absorption. So if we just take a look at the, the tube of the small intestine, you'll see it kind of has this ribbed structure. It looks like it has ribs. And those are what are called circular folds that um, are going to increase the surface area. So if you have a wavy surface, it's going to have more surface area than a flat surface. The same applies for villi and microvilli. Villi being waves of numerous cells that have absorptive capabilities. And then microvilli, on the cells themselves. So this is a number of cells making up uh, an epithelial cell layer. And the cells themselves have microvilli on the top that makes up what's called the brush border. So the brush border is um, where specifically on these cells um, absorption is taking place. So underneath you have the bloodstream and nutrients have to cross this layer of cells. So um, circular folds, villi, and then finally microvilli all are going to increase the total surface area for absorption. So there's also um, some chemical and mechanical digestion occurring. Um, chemical digestion being um, enzymes that are delivered to the duodenum from uh, the pancreas and um, the liver and gallbladder are helping with the chemical aspect of digestion, as well as um, the mechanical aspect being a process called segmentation. So segmentation is going to be um, where the circular smooth muscle, so not the longitudinal, but only the circular smooth muscle is contracting. So when you get rhythmic contraction of circular and longitudinal smooth muscle, you get peristalsis or movement um, in one direction with only the circular smooth muscle contracting, you get this process in the intestine called segmentation, which basically still has a churning function like you saw um, in the stomach. So segmentation assists with the mechanical digestion. Um, and in this, underneath um, the, uh, you know, those epithelial cells that make up the cells with the brush border that are doing absorption, um, you have your blood vessels and also lymphatic vessels um, called lacteals, um, and they're there for absorption of dietary fats. Um, so the small intestine is where a large amount of absorption is taking place. Um, and the small intestine is also going to be able to release some hormones that, again, control motility, but also the amount of acid that's being secreted by the stomach. Um, so that will about do it for the intestine, and later we'll get on uh, to end this, um, this lecture, this video lecture, we'll talk more specifically about the enzymes that uh, make it into the small intestine from um, those exocrine glands, the uh, liver and the gallbladder uh, and the pancreas. Once what's left, what hasn't yet been absorbed, has, been, uh, has made it into the large intestines, um, there's a little bit of absorption that's still yet to, to happen. And this, this occurs in um, the early portions of the small intestine where you have absorption of water, some electrolytes, and a few vitamins. Um, importantly, 
uh, the large intestine is going to house lots of bacteria. Um, you might have heard this referred to as the gut flora or the microbiota of your gut. Um, and these are going to have beneficial effects like fighting off um, you know, pathogenic bacteria. Uh, they can also boost immune function. They can synthesize vitamins. Um, they can also break down some food that uh, the rest of our digestive system isn't equipped to do. So um, the normal gut flora have a variety of beneficial effects and uh, they are kind of like our symbiotes. Um, so they've colonized our large intestine and we work together. Um, also the large intestine lastly is going to have a propulsive effect on um, and what's called the mass movement which is ultimately going to result in defecation or the release of the feces, the undigested material um, or the metabolic waste. And this uh, defecation is controlled by a parasympathetic um, reflex as well as the cerebral cortex. Um, so lastly, we're going to uh, take a look at um, some of those accessory organs, the pancreas, the liver, and um, the gallbladder, and how they contribute to our ability to digest and absorb nutrients.